So we will be starting the session in two minutes. Just bear with us. <clears throat> That's okay. Okay, sir. So we begin the session with the planetary talk of Dr. Martin Milton. Dr. Martin Milton has been the director of International Bureau of Weights and Measures since 2013. He has taken over the Bureau's leadership at an important point in his 137 year history when 55 member countries will be working to redefine four of the SI base units in terms of fundamental constants. Before taking over as BIPM director, Dr. Milton had a long career at the United Kingdom's National Physical Laboratory, where he began in 1981, shortly after he earned a BA in physics from the University of Oxford. Over the next 31 years, he earned both a PhD from the University of Southampton and an MBA and rose to become an NPL fellow. He has always had, an, had a special interest in the applications of standard gas measurements to environmental measurements and was involved in the assessment of global emissions of methane for the intergovernmental, for the intergovernmental panel on climate change. In 2013, he was awarded an honorary Professorship in Chemistry by the University of York. So we start the talk of Dr. Milton, Martin Milton. Hello, I'm Martin Milton. I'm the director of the BIPM, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures here in Paris. I'm very sorry not to be able to join you today at ADMET in New Delhi. I very much enjoyed the ADMET conference when I've attended in the past, and I look forward to being together with you again in the future. I'm pleased to be able to send this video recording to be part of the meeting today. I'd like to talk to you uh, about some of our latest work on digital transformation. And I've chosen the title Developments Towards Interoperable Metrology, the work of the BIPM to develop new digital services. I'd like to start by putting our work in the context of the history of our organization. The BIPM, of course, was founded in 1875 when 17 states signed the Meter Convention on the 20th of May here in Paris. At that time, our organization uh, was a, a lot smaller than it is today and had smaller ambitions and scope than it does today. The CIPM, for example, 
had just 14 members and the staff of the organisation was just one director with his two assistants. Of course, we had the CGPM and we had the CIPM overseeing our work. We have them still today, but now we have 63 member states as well as 33 associate states in economies. The CIPM has been expanded by the agreement of the CGPM to 18 members. And within the headquarters now, we have myself, the director, together with 70 staff. Our organisation has been growing at the time that the impact and opportunity for the use of metrology has also grown. While we're talking about the increasing impact and increasing scope of metrology, let's look at how the SI, the centrepiece of uh, our system of measurement units, has changed. In 2018, we agreed some important new definitions for the SI, but these were not the first changes in the SI. The term SI was first developed and agreed by the CIPM and the CGPM in 1960, and it was agreed for a system with six units. Since then, it's been changed on several occasions when there's been opportunities for new applications of metrology, or when there have been opportunities for the application of new technologies of importance for metrology. For example, in 1967, we adopted the atomic definition of the second, which is now fundamental to everything we do in timekeeping. In 1990, we took on board the opportunity to make reference to the quantum standards of the Josephs Josephson effect and the von Klitzing effect for our standards for uh, the ampere and the volt within the electrical system. In 1983, we adopted for the first time the definition of the speed of light to define the meter, the first time an explicit definition of a fundamental constant was used to define a, uh, a measurement unit within the SI. In parallel with these changes in the SI, our work at the BIPM with it amongst uh, our headquarters staff here has also changed. It was only in 1961 that we first started working in ionising radiation. In 1985 we started the time department when the calculation of UTC was moved uh, uh, under our authority. In 1999 we started the work on the key comparison database. In 2000 uh, we launched the chemistry department and more recently we started to work on capacity building, which is now essential work, a part of our programme. All of these changes were brought together in 2018, as I mentioned, uh, when the CGPM agreed the new definitions of the SI Resolution A on the revision of the international system of units. Well, 2018 is now four years ago, and we're working towards the 27th meeting of the CGPM, which will meet this year. November, also in Versailles in 2022. And I want to talk uh, today about the importance of the work that is summarised under Resolution B with the title on the Global Digital Transformation and the SI Units. So the text of Resolution B, and please look at this uh, on the internet, on the BIPM website, uh, if you're interested to follow through on uh, what I'm going to say today. So Resolution B states that the CIPM seeks, seeks for, for the CGPM to mandate the CIPM to undertake the development and promotion of an SI digital framework. And then it tells us something about this new SI digital framework, that it should be a globally accepted digital representation of the SI, compatible with and usable within digital data exchange standards and protocols that maintains compatibility with existing non-digital solutions. Also, the CGPM is expected to endorse the principle that uh, we should adopt the FAIR principles, the FAIR principles for access to digital data. FAIR principles, I'll say a little bit more about this to explain how they work, are that data should be findable accessible, interoperable and reusable. 
So what is this fair data that is a principle underpinning the, the mandate, the desire to make our data interoperable and widely readable? It can be traced back to a statement from the leaders of the G20 nations at their summit held in Hangzhou in 2016. As part of the communique at the end of that summit, uh, the communique stated that the G20 nations would support appropriate efforts to promote open science and facilitate appropriately access to publicly funded research results on findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable the FAIR principles. So this FAIR data, this F-A-I-R, this findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, uh, what's, it, what's meant by these terms? So data that are findable are findable when they're described by sufficiently rich metadata and registered or indexed in a searchable resource. So they're findable in our new digital world. They're findable on the internet by searching with, with, with the right reference or with the right system, the data can be found. To be accessible, uh, data objects must be obtained through a well-defined and universally implemented protocol. So the A in FAIR doesn't necessarily mean that everything is open or free, but it means that it can be accessed through protocols that are recognized, shared, uh, and used very widely. To be interoperable, data and metadata must use a formal, accessible, shared, and broadly applicable language. And for data to be reusable, rich metadata and documentary data must meet relevant community standards. There's a great deal of information available about the FAIR principles and about their implementation, and many fields of science have committed to implement them in all the data they use. And I think it will be a, a very important point for the metrology community when we expect the CGPM in November 2022 to make a commitment about the adoption of the FAIR principles for metrology. Now I've talked about F and A and I and R. Uh, I'm gonna say a little bit about what we're doing at the BIPM uh, with our services and, and databases to adopt them. But something that's worth saying is that uh, this is a significant challenge to take on board uh, the true interoperability of data. In this little graphic here, I indicate by the size of the letters, the relative difficulty of uh, the relative challenge involved in uh, creating FAIR data. Whereas making data accessible is a little bit more difficult than making it findable, making it interoperable is a really significant challenge, as is making it reusable. I'm going to show you how we're starting to think about how we address that challenge at the BIPM. Before I do that, let me put this in the context of the work of the CIPM, who've put in place uh, their proposals for what they called the SI Digital Framework. The SI Digital Framework is a framework, a conceptual framework, that has three layers. It has an applications layer at the top there in the diagram. All of the applications, the digital certificates, the applications coming out of databases, the use of data and certificates, uh, the, the development of new services in NMIs, all the applications. Applicants should depend on a service layer, a set of uh, protocols, a set of ontologies, a set of databases, uh, a, a set of interoperability facilities that can enable the applications layer to work. Both the applications layer and the service layer are based very centrally on the SI core. This is the digital representation of the data we know in the SI brochure and in the other principles, the other decisions of the CGPM that underpin our SI system. So how can the work of the BIPM laboratories and databases lead to findable and accessible data? So let's look again at the SI Digital Framework 
being developed by the CIPM. At the centre of it is this, is this uh, principle of the inverted pyramid. With the applications layer at the top, the service layer in the middle, and all based on the SI core defined by the CIPM and the CGPM. So what's in this applications area? The starting point for the applications layer, of course, is new digital applications and services developed by NMIs. The one of these that we talk about the most at the moment is the provision of digital calibration certificates. When we talk about a digital calibration certificate, of course, we mean much more than just a PDF of a, uh, of a hard copy certificate. We mean a calibration certificate that is itself a digital object that contains within it digital references to reference all the points, the definitions of the units, the uh, status of the lab, and uh, uh, as well as digital references to the data and where users can access that data. But it's also foreseen in the SI digital framework that the CIPM task group are working on, that there will be other new digital services, uh, such as uh, the capability for NMIs to maintain uh, real-time data updates through their websites. We already have a project uh, ongoing in collaboration with the NMIs uh, called the International Metrology Resource Registry. Uh, you may not have heard much about this yet, but you'll hear more about it in the future as we make this available as a, uh, as a repository where NMIs with new services can register those services in a single web space uh, that becomes an international repository of metrology information. But it's from those NMI applications that new user-driven applications come along. This is the most exciting part where the new services at NMIs can facilitate new activities, uh, more efficient industry, more effective uh, implementation of regulations, uh, better transport of goods across borders, for example. All of the applications of measurement services that we do today are done more efficiently and probably quicker through digital mechanisms. So within the service layer and within the, within the SI core, there is quite a lot of detail. Let me take you through uh, some of the points that are most important in there. If we start at the bottom, of course, the SI core is fundamentally the material in the SI brochure. The SI brochure here interpreted as meaning the text of the thing, and also the text and agreed protocols within all of the mise en pratique, the practical realization documents. It's those agreed definitions for the SI, together with the practical applications of them, agreed by the consultative committees. These are the central core of the SI. This is what the SI, how the SI works. This is how we know that the SI is working correctly. Since 2018, we know that there's another important input to the SI is uh, the values of the fundamental constants. Uh, seven of those were agreed to be the basis for the definitions of the seven units, but there's a wider set of fundamental constants. These are also part of a wider set of data that one could consider to be part of the core references for the SI. So what are the services that we need to provide, the new digital services that we need to provide at BIPM emerging from these SI core, this SI core data? I want to uh, divide that into two sorts. I want to divide it into the SI digital references and also what you might call portal services. What do I mean by that? Well, we are planning to put in place new databases that will provide access, digital and machine readable access, to the essential data for the standard frequencies and wavelengths. I'll say something more about this in the late, later in the talk. Something more about the uh, implementation of the ITS-90 temperature scale, but also comparable information required to realise the other base units. These underpin, in turn, 
what we might call our shared portal services, such as the key comparison database with its CMCs, the other part of the key comparison database with the key comparisons and the supplementary comparisons, but also the database of the Joint Committee for Traceability in Laboratory Medicine and the UTC database and other databases that we're developing at VIPM. These, if you like, are our shared portal services where we're providing global access to metrology data that belongs to and is developed by the NMIs and is overseen in some ways by the RMOs. So that was uh, what we like to call the data plane. It's the, it's the facilities that are needed to provide data that will be findable and accessible. But remember to make uh, fair, we also need the I and the R. In order to do that, uh, we need what we call uh, the interoperability plane. I'll go through this more quickly. The core in the interoperability plane uh, is the SI brochure, but it's also uh, the SI vocabulary, the VIM, and the SI information about implementing uh, on the, the, cal uh, the uh, calculation of measurement uncertainties. These are needed to state clearly, uh, we use them every day, but these are needed in a machine readable digital exchange world to show machines how we do these things, how we structure our vocabulary and how we calculate our measurement uncertainties. The documents I talk about at the bottom there though, of course, aren't machine readable documents. Machines need structured data. They need uh, documents to be uh, transposed into a format that they can uh, the, uh, from, from which they can deduce the uh, the format and understand from uh, broader ontological considerations how to interpret the data so in order to uh, provide uh, that sort of information we provide we, we were already working on what we call the unique SI reference point and we'll say a little bit more about this in the uh, later in the talk uh, we're also working and it'll be a big future work in the coming four years to put in place ontologies explaining how the terms that are used in metrology work together these things alone uh, don't enable us to communicate uh, everything about metrology to the outside world unless we're also able to map what we say and the unit systems we use to unit systems in use in the outside world. Uh, for that reason, uh, we will need to develop interfaces and we already have uh, a prototype of some of these running at the BIPM. Uh, interfaces that will enable us to map units and to map uh, rules for using digital systems that are machine readable. So to achieve our fare, we need both of these planes of interacting digital systems to be working together. That's all a little bit theoretical, perhaps. I want to move on now to some real examples. I want to explain how can BIPM support what we might call the new era of digital NMIs by supporting the open data practices, by implementing digital formats and by providing machine accessible data and reference information. How can we become the trusted hub for metrology data? Let me give my first example with the key comparison database. The key comparison database is a central tool, I believe, in the world metrology community. Uh, we have information in there from 259 institutes around the world, uh, data about nearly 26,000 calibration and measurement capabilities, and more than 1,700 key comparisons. Currently, uh, the key comparison database is a database accessible on our website. We've recently upgraded it to the what we call the KCDB 2.0 standard, which has made uh, life and uh, review processes within uh, the regional metrology organizations significantly more efficient. We're very pleased to have collaborated over that. But to create a machine readable version of the key comparison database, we need to provide an interface that machines can visit, that machines can send inquiries to, and machines can receive uh, structured responses from. 
So we've done this. It's called an application programming interface. Uh, if you visit our website and, and, and type in API, you'll, you'll be able to find information about this and the other application programming interfaces that we're now working on at the BIPM. That's the case study of the KCDB. Let me say something about the case study of digital transformation of our data in the time department that's used to underpin the world time scale, the universal coordinated time UTC. So within our time department at BIPM, we have an enormous amount of data. We have data coming in from around 450 clocks in 80 laboratories around the world. Around one and a half terabytes of data comes in each year. Each uh, week, we, com we compute uh, a product that brings all of uh, this data together that we call Rapid UTC. And monthly, we calculate the reference timescale for the world UTC and publish that in our publication Circular T, which includes all the values of the best estimates of the representation of UTC in all of the UTC labs. All of this is available through a database. It's a web database and there's also a, a file transfer download facility that we've been using for many years. And in, 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 in all ways, the time department have really always used the best available digital technology to enable NMIs to exploit their data. But we are now working to put in place a programming interface, an API that enables uh, direct access to the data, enables NMIs to access our data directly and receive data directly on request uh, from our, through our API interface to our database. This is a very exciting uh, new development. We're doing some uh, beta testing on it on the moment, uh, doing some beta testing on it at the moment, and there's information about that from our website. Let's look at some of the applications uh, for data through a programming interface to our UTC database. It enables NMIs, for example, to monitor their own representation of UTC, the UTCK timescales, and for example, to uh, display it on, on NMI websites in real time. It enables potentially automatic steering in NMIs of their own version of UTC case. It's an option. It's a potential for a new NMI service facilitated by the digital transformation of our services. It also enables, and we know that this is already in place by at least one of the global navigation satellite system operators, it enables them to steer and monitor the stability of their system. So we've launched a programming interface for the key comparison database. Uh, we're doing the beta testing in the time department. There are many other projects underway. I don't have time today to talk about the project underway in the CCL, CCTF community, but that's another very exciting project. This is a representation in the uh, old style, if you like, of the complexity of our SI system. I said earlier that to make a machine readable system, we need to create a structured version of this data, not just a PDF version of the book, but a structured version of the data. I'd like to introduce now uh, my colleague, Dr. Janet Miles, who's been working on what we call the SI unique reference point. She'll explain to you how we're going about creating this structured basis for SI data to make it machine operable. Thanks, Martin. I'm very glad to have the chance to tell you a little bit more about the unique SI reference point, which is one of the key elements of this interoperability plane. I'm sure you're all familiar with the SI, the International System of Units, which provides the world with a common language for expressing, uh, expressing units. And the SI brochure published by the BIPM is the ultimate reference for this international system of units. The SI brochure itself, now in its ninth edition, contains the definitions, the key decisions, and a lot of historical information about why the SI is what it is today. So 
So now we've considered the SI brochure, let's consider what the machines need. Most importantly, rather than HTML or PDF, the machines need structured data. They need persistent identifiers and they need an interface through which they can call on the content to find the answers to their requests. And typically in terms of the SI brochure, we will need to provide the definitions of the SI units, the SI prefixes and the fundamental constants. In the future, you can imagine that the BIPM data services will be linked to this unique SI reference point. And indeed, any external data, as long as they are expressed either directly through the SI reference point or through another user in representation system that is linked to the reference point, then through a unit mapping service, any API query coming into the BIPM data service will be able to be answered by the BIPM services in the unit encoding system chosen by the user. So now on to the unique SI reference point itself. This has been described in a document presented to the CIPM expert group and has indeed been uh, presented to them in the form of a prototype, which I'm going to share with you shortly. Prototype. So before I show you the prototype, remember this is just a prototype. The model can still be refined. And this is just one part in that digital landscape that uh, Martin presented to you. I've got to give an enormous thank you to Stuart Chalk, who is actually the person uh, who programmed it. So Dr. Stuart Chalk from the University of North Florida, thank you very much. Ron Say of Ribos provided invaluable advice. And thanks also to Bob Hanish, Blair Hall and Ryan White, who all commented on the uh, prototype. So without further ado, let's go and have a look. This is openly available. If you'd like to go back and have a look, you're very welcome. siunits.stewchalk.domains.unf.edu. Now, it's rather small on my screen, but I hope you can um, follow me. In any case, you can uh, go and look at it yourselves. So if we just whiz down the SI base units on the left-hand side, you can see um, that they're all individually clickable. And here I've just clicked on kilogram. We have uh, a definition, we have a PID, this is the permanent identifier, and in the future there would be a DOI so that the computer and the person can find the information easily. We have the definition as given in the SI brochure, we have the reference, um, the CGPM resolution, we have the status, there you can see this definition was uh, applied from the 20th of May in 2019. And we also have previous versions. So, for instance, the 1889 definition, which, of course, has a different permanent identifier. What else do we have? Well, if we scroll down to the bottom of the page, you see we can have you can click on a link for the equation for the kilogram. Now, the equation, equation for the kilogram is given here in two different formats, the first of which is LaTeX to facilitate in importation into a PDF if somebody's publishing. And secondly, it's given in MathJSON. Um, this is to allow um, a machine that's talking in JSON code to pick up the definition, definition in, uh, directly in JSON. The page also has an API to provide the machine access. As I said, this is the human version, the web page, and the machine would access through an API and get something that looks like that, which is far too small for me to show, so I will I will move on, but the API is there. So that was a base unit. Um, the same sort of uh, structure exists for the derived units with special names, which will need to be defined either in terms of the base units or in terms of the fundamental constants, of course. So here, if we look at the, the equation, get the equation in terms of the fundamental constants or in terms of the base units. The fundamental constants themselves have their numbers, their units in terms of the SI units, the SI um, base units, and the prefixes of course, give the scaling factors. So just to make sure we realize it is um, easy to use, the for combined units, well, 
a unit such as nanosecond, for instance, which has a prefix and the definition second. We would have a page that would have both, so you would know that one second and one nanosecond are defined in the system. And here's another example, milligray per second. So we've got a numerator unit, a numerator prefix, and a denominator unit. With that, I've reached the end of my whistle-stop tour of the unique SI reference point. This is just a prototype, but I'll look forward to coming back to you with the real thing soon. And for now, let me hand you back to Martin. Thank you very much, Janet. Uh, I think that uh, provides a lot of information and a lot of food for thought about the possibilities of a digital transformation of our SI, of putting in place this SI digital framework that the CIPM have mandated. I showed you this slide uh, 10 minutes ago and talked about how we are working to support the new generation of digital NMIs, and I hope you've seen examples of that today. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you again at ADMET. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to present to you at ADMET. Um, I visited uh, and attended ADMET in 2013 and enjoyed uh, meeting many of you then. Um, my name is Sam Benz. I am leader of the Superconductive Electronics Group at NIST in Boulder, and I work on superconductive electronics for quantum-based voltage metrology. Uh, this is uh, all the members of my group for the past few years, and we uh, build uh, devices and measurement uh, techniques for DC and AC voltage and RF communications and for digital and quantum computing. Today, I'd like to tell you about uh, the Josephson effect and how it's applied to Josephson standards. I'll briefly mention how the international system of units has evolved as a result of quantum electrical effects. And I'll describe uh, in more detail the two types of NIST standard reference instruments, the programmable JVS or Josephson voltage standard for DC voltage and the Josephson Arbitrary Waveform Synthesizer or JAWS for AC voltage. And we are working and doing significant amounts of research to extend uh, waveform synthesis that is quantum based to RF signals and as pulse generators uh, to control uh, qubits with reproducible signals. There are two main types of quantization behavior that we're exploiting with the Josephson effect. The first is one that uses and exploits voltage steps when a Josephson junction is biased with microwave frequencies. The Josephson currents that are AC lock to those microwave frequencies and create constant voltage steps. And we all, they also produce quantized voltage pulses such that the area of each voltage pulse is the ratio of Planck's constant over twice the electronic charge. And we can digitally synthesize uh, pulsed waveforms by controlling those digital pulses, or we can move those pulses and flux quanta through a superconducting network to produce logic and pulse generators. And the last couple circuits will use the latter approaches of quantization behavior. Um, the challenge for Josephson technologies is that H over 2E is a small number. It's a couple microvolts per gigahertz. And we want practical output voltages of volt, a volt or 10 volts, and that requires large series arrays. So we need many tens or hundreds of thousands of junctions in series. If we use typical uh, microwave frequencies of 10 or 20 gigahertz, then we get only 20 or 40 microvolts per junction. So this requires very uniform junctions, not because uh, the voltage uh, uh, the voltage is accurate for each of those. Uh, junctions, but the current range over which they produce the quantized voltage must overlap so that we can connect them all in series and use a single common bias. So this is what we call a, a quantum locking range for these junctions, uh, the range of bias over which they produce the quantum behavior. In order to produce this, the junctions need the same uh, electrical properties and the same applied microwave power. And that's that's a challenge in terms of microwave design and fabrication. Um, early in the last century, 
the voltage was, standards were based on electrochemical batteries called Weston cells typically. They were dependent on in, and changed in time and on environmental conditions. After the Joseph effect was discovered in 1960, two, um, People realized that with the microwave biases applied, a few a, a single junctions could produce 10 millivolts very accurately. And already with that lower voltage agreement between laboratories improved by uh, two orders of magnitude. Many years of development were required to further improve uh, the conventional Joseon voltage standard uh, to reach one volt and 10 volts, and that achieved another two orders of magnitude improvement. And over the last uh, 20 years, additional improvements in technology that I was able to be involved with has enabled the programmable Josephson voltage standard uh, to make further advances and improve another order of magnitude in agreement. So let me, uh, I'll talk about uh, the programmable st Josephson standard in a moment. Uh, the Internet system of units prior to May of 2019 still depended upon physical artifacts, namely the kilogram uh, uh, was a platinum iridium cylinder mass. Uh, the quantum electrical effects of uh, Josephson and quantum Hall for voltage and resistance were essentially outside of the SI system and were only uh, representations of voltage and resistance. Um, but after the redefinition, that changed. And this changed uh, by pre precision measurements of the kilogram using a current balance. But this current balance, uh, as identified by Brian Kibble, essentially becomes, becomes a mechanical electrical power balance by exploiting both the Josephson and quantum Hall effects so that measurement of the kilogram mass is effectively a measurement of the Planck constant. So the quantum electrical effects were important in redefining and measuring the kilogram and redefining the SI system in terms of fundamental constants. So now in 2019 and later, our revised SI is based on seven unchanging universal constants and no longer is based on artifact standards. And so as we in voltage have replaced the artifact standard of the Weston cell with a quantum standard. Now we have an entire system of units ba based on universal constants. So now the Josephson voltage is a realization of the volt for the first time in the decades I have worked in this field. So let me move on to talk about how the program with Josephson voltage standard works. Uh, it is based on a series array that is divided into subarrays of smaller numbers of junctions, and we change the bias on those smaller subarrays, either the minus one or zero or plus one step, uh, and can program one of one of those three states. And then the output voltage can be programmed by changing the number of junctions that are biased on a particular voltage. Uh, many years of advances to develop different types of junctions and microwave circuits and also instrumentation and cryogenics have resulted in uh, the current version of our standard reference instrument, which is a cryo-cooled 10-volt PJVS system. And uh, it's also uh, lots of software has been developed to make this instrument useful. Um, it essentially uh, uses 16 arrays of 16,800 junctions, and those junctions in each array have to be sufficiently uniform, and the microwave power, as I said before, has to be also uniform to all of those junctions so that every one of those six arrays of 16,800 junctions essentially behaves like a single junction and has a constant voltage step. And in this uh, example, it's, it's flat over this two milliamp range, and we call this a quantum locking range for those subarrays. And then the entire circuit can also operate over that same two milliamp range. Um, here's an example uh, also of the DC current bias uh, quantum locking range. You can see that over this few milliamp range, it is also quantum locked. Uh, the color scheme is the difference voltage from 10 volts from the measured 10 volts being generated. And we also are changing the quantum, uh, the bias for the microwave power 
uh, because that is another uh, bias condition that has a quantum locking range. So this is true for, for all of these Joseph voltage standards. Um, I just wanted to show a picture of the PJVS system in NPL's voltage metrology lab. Back in 19, uh, or 2012, Alain Rufenacht and I uh, uh, worked with BJ Oja uh, to install this system. And this was essentially one of the very first uh, examples of our fully integrated system before we turned the system into a standard reference instrument. So uh, this, uh, this collaboration helped us to develop our standard reference instrument. Let me move on now to the Josen Arbitrary Waveform Synthesizer. This exploits uh, the digital synthesis of quantized pulses so that the density of pulses uh, essentially determines uh, the output voltage of an AC waveform. Um, the, uh, a few years ago, uh, we were able to demonstrate a two volt RMS uh, output using two chips with 100,000 Joseph's junctions. And the one kilohertz sine wave here shown on the left of the graph uh, is producing two volts precisely. Um, and you can see harmonic distortion appearing that is at multiples of the kilohertz uh, signal. And those are not a, a source from the Josephson array, uh, but are due to nonlinearities of the analog to digital converter that is measuring the signal. Um, so you can see that A to D converters are also very accurate because those signals are more than 120 dB down from the signal. Uh, let me now show you the quantum locking range of that measurement uh, in, and also show you it as a function of the quantum locking range of the current bias through the arrays, as well as the power um, being applied to those pulses. So this color plot uh, is uh, the difference voltage from the measured sine wave, and the horizontal axis is the period of uh, the waveform, and the vertical axis is the current bias. And we're going to measure over this 1.1 milliamp DC current range and use those data to plot uh, our spectrum. As you can see here, it's again uh, synthesizing that two volt signal. We now have a log frequency, so those harmonic distortion peaks are, are, are not uh, uh, linearly distributed. And uh, it's generating that two volt output. And this harmonic distortion, we can measure that and use that again also to see uh, the quantum locking range for the microwave pulse or the pulse amplitude on this bottom curve. And you can see that uh, uh, as we I'm going to play a video now that shows how we move that pulse amplitude and you'll see the harmonic distortion grow when uh, the, there is not quantized uh, uh, pulses being generated and we're getting too many pulses or too few pulses and so forth um, as uh, the pulse amplitude is moved off of that flat range. So let me play that video now. Hopefully you can see it. So here you can see we're increasing the pulse amplitude and we get distortion inside of that current bias range. And again, as we lower the pulse amplitude, we see the same thing. And then as we go back into the quantum locking range for the pulse amplitude, we get the quantum accurate voltage again. And you can see that the value of the AC voltage is clearly changing, but the total harmonic distortion is a better measure of the quantum locking range. OK, uh, the current state of the art for this system is uh, uh, twice this uh, voltage that I showed previously. We now can produce four volts RMS uh, for our standard reference instrument. Uh, we're trying to extend uh, these signals for the PJVS and JAWS uh, above a few hundred kilohertz now into the range of a few gigahertz using an RF JAWS and using quantized pulse synthesizers using an SFQ JAWS, and I'll briefly describe those next. Um, so let's start with the RF JAW synthesizers, and these are primarily for quantum based accurate signals that we hope to employ for calibrating RF communications instruments. So this is uh, requires a different type of uh, microwave circuit, uh, typically using diplexers and so forth. Um, 
and uh, we have been able to use this technology to synthesize uh, signals up to uh, a gigahertz. Um, and on the left, you can see uh, again we're we're changing the DC bias through the array. And at the top left graph, you can see that the fundamental is constant over a range of about two milliamps of this dither, and the noise uh, measured is also uh, uh, small and minimized over that same current range. And on the right graph, you can see the color code again. The difference uh, from the the measured difference from the desired uh, two millivolt signal, and we can produce uh, the same quantized. Um, uh, signals over a range of frequencies from 400 megahertz to gigahertz over this 2 milliamp uh, quantum locking range for this device. Uh, we've been able to increase this output voltage now up to 20 millivolts, uh, in this, and this is getting close to the range uh, to be useful for measuring uh, components. We believe we can uh, be useful for measuring components uh, up to 50 uh, millivolts or 100 millivolts. And the advantage of this system isn't necessarily its voltage accuracy, but its stability and reproducibility. Uh, and the uh, the fact that we don't have to have um, a calibration change uh, to produce the, uh, to measure these signals uh, as a source, they're intrinsically accurate. SFQ JAWS um, is also uh, producing uh, quantized pulses, and uh, we hope to control qubits with this, and we, we have actually demonstrated that over the last year. Uh, this circuit is uh, multiplying uh, using a shift register and a splitter network to uh, combine eight uh, quantized pulses uh, uh, simultaneously, and using digital synthesis, we have been able to produce a four gigahertz signal um, I believe of uh, of a few millivolts, and simultaneously uh, with an, with enough quantization uh, and digital synthesis, we're simultaneously generating a 50 kilohertz signal, as shown in the inset. And using that lower frequency signal, we can show that the quantum locking range is about 100 microamps uh, for both for both uh, output signals. Uh, we've used uh, this SFQ JAWS and other ones similar to it uh, in a dilution refrigerator at the, on the three Kelvin stage to control qubits at millikelvin temperatures. And I encourage you to look at this paper by Adam Soroy from 2020 and another and others that are about to come out um, uh, by other uh, researchers in my group. So in conclusion, I'd like to uh, emphasize that I believe that Joseph voltage standards have a bright future. Uh, they have enabled the SSI redefinition by eliminating many artifact standards, and uh, there's potential to have impact in RF communications and control circuits for quantum computing. Thank you very much. I hope I can hear you uh, to answer some questions. Or maybe you can type them and I'm sorry, I, I can't hear anything. Apologize. So sorry. I, I heard a little bit there. I think maybe it's. Um, oh, yeah, it's oversampling. I'm not sure. It keeps cutting out. Uh, just, just trying to get the connection. I could hear you there for a bit. Are you able to type the questions in the chat?
Okay, I, I see the question uh, about a, pon a quantum power standard. Um, thank you, Shiv. Um, yes, um, we are we are developing that for an internal uh, program. Um, it is still under development, um, and again, it will be at low uh, RF powers. Um, but uh, as you know. Uh, uh, quantum computing and uh, and and such applications uh, have distracted many research groups, including our own, because uh, there is a lot of, of interest to to support the growing quantum industry. So we have uh, had to uh, slow our work on power standards. I, I'm sorry to say, but thank you for that question. Yes, I can add. Uh, the question is, uh, what about qubit addressing? Uh, controlling of qubits um, uh, is very important. Um, you, many of you have probably seen photographs of dilution refrigerators uh, that are used to control uh, um, circuits with 50 or 100 qubits with 50 and 100 um, coaxes driving them. So. Um, this is all, every one of those bias lines uh, to drive a single qubit requires calibration, and they change every time the refrigerator is thermally cycled. So by having uh, an SFQ JAWS multiplier or an RF JAWS uh, in the refrigerator, producing reproducible signals every time they're, they're cooled down because the pulses are, are reproducible and quantized, should make scaling quantum computers uh, more possible um, because they don't require calibration. They're essentially self-calibrated. So that's why we're interested in using Joseph's injunctions to drive and control qubits. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I'm sorry. Sorry for the communication challenges. Bye bye. Sir, on the Upper. The second, the second So, next, so uh, there is no need uh, for his introduction. He is uh, complete. So now we are going to be Hello, hello. I'm not audible. Hello, you are audible. Okay. Now, uh, today I have chosen a topic: importance of education in metrology. I feel in the present audience, it may seem to be a topic out of the box because it doesn't talk about any of the parameters we are talking about in the metrology. But this is the subject I was thinking for the last couple of years that this is not the topic has not been enough emphasized and talked about. Let me talk about mainly my experience, how I learned metrology 
and what are the difficulties I faced, how much effort I had to put to know about the methodology. So I'll go through that. So it's a short presentation, but with an uh, idea about my thought process. So, Okay, so I have outlined the talks. It is not mine. Use this one also. So, at firstly, after a small introduction, I go through what I experienced when the internet was not there. What is my experience after introduction of internet? And what is the Indian effort in this direction? And some other initiatives, and then I'll conclude what I'm trying to say. So, you are all experts in metrology sitting here. You know that measuring the measurement matters to metrology. And we know that when you make any measurements, we get some value and try to know how far it is true from, how close it is true from true value. And we term it as an accuracy, error, uncertainty, and all those things. But the, Practical situation in the general public is that everybody, we all know that in our daily life, how much metrology matters, measurement matters. But still, hardly anybody uh, understands it, whether it is visible to that, that measurement is important in their life and it is not noticed, it is not recognized by them. Even if I recall my days when I joined NPL, before that, even I didn't know the word metrology. I knew the word meteorology. And meteorology is the word which was known because it always used to give the weather forecast. The main department used to give a forecast, and the forecast mostly those days were wrong. Things change. Now we get the most cost fairly accurate, and there the importance of the metrology plays a very important role because this is measurement and all these things has improved a lot. Now, still today, metrology is the unusual profession. Nobody knows that there are not metrologists around the world. And in NPL is full of metrologists who are experts in this field. So metrology, particularly in development, but is a very weak subject because there is no exposure. And the most glaring part is that if you make a measurement and if there is an incorrect in the measurement, that might have a very dire sequence, like a breach may collapse, and then people will start talking about the metrology, oh, that material has not been properly tested, trace analysis has not been done, then everybody will talk about it. This happens always. Now, so, metrology should have a broad, all around the education, strong background in physics, applied statistics, he should know, or he or should have a specialized knowledge in several metrology engineering areas. So that is the requirement of a metrologist. But when a enter into the field, 
he has no exposure, no nothing at all to what is happening. So I'll tell you my experience in the free internet area. I still remember when I got a call from NPL for the interview, there was a word atomic clock. And it was a new word to me. I didn't know what is atomic clock. So my guy said, don't worry about the what is atomic clock. Whatever you have learned in the MSc, you present it properly what you did in PhD. And fortunately, there was no question. What is atomic clock? How much do you know about the atomic clock in the interview board? That is why I'm here and in PhD. So, but the again important thing I would like to say that it's a, it's a broad subject. It covers sensor, instrument, measurement, testing, processing, evaluation of measured data, and all those things. But when I came here, my first question that time, Dr. B. S. Mathur was our head. I questioned, what is that of a clock? So, can I you take? Hold it. Don't be impatient. He gave me few books and literatures. He go through it. Then I saw what is atomic clock because fortunately that time NPL already had one atomic clock purchased. And then after two, three days, I went to the uh, room number 35 where one atomic clock was there. And two, I frankly say it was really unimpressive instrument. It's still a 19 inch rack, simple instrument which I have seen while I was studying MSc, so many instruments like that. Then when I was taught and I was given an exposure uh, with some literature like uh, proceeding so I triply on special issue on time and frequency. It was in first issue in 1956. This gave a very good idea of what time and frequency is and what is the basis of his measurement and all those things. Then late in 1978, Three, four years after joining NPL, I got the book in hand by Peter Kursov, who himself visited NPL that time, and he handed over a few books to the staff of NPL. And that was a very comprehensive book. Still, it made me a very useful book for the pursuits of the time of the So, internet made a sea change in the information whatever you'd like to give it. I just get first book on the internet written by Michael Harris. He nicely titled the book, End of Absence. He wanted to say what happened before the internet and right. what happened after the internet. So that is the pilgrimage from before and after. And the course the internet, what is the basic information, the, what is the basic advantage of that? And that too came to India when BSNL made it available uh, on 15 August 1995, after many years after my joining in So that is the time when you could have get any information by the click of the mouse on internet. It gradually matured and we started getting all this. So that was the main source of our knowing what metrology and different subjects. Other than the peers or seniors who had some experience and they could pass on some of their experience to us. Now there are many courses of metrology on the YouTube. But I don't know, I have not gone through those YouTubes. How effective those YouTubes are, I do not know whether it's a, it's a layman's or it's a really useful. But these days there are many Online courses are there. For example, BIPM recently launched an e-learning course on dissemination of kilogram following its redefinition and realization of kilogram following its redefinition, particularly related to table balance, which was shown by the previous speaker just now. And this is the portal. So, and there are many online courses, open educational source learningmajor.com and Wikipedia is also has some stall I think they might have a talk. And there is a national program on technology enhanced learning 
I have gone through those things, uh, but there is not enough uh, program which covers metrology at a very uh, detail around those things. So, so online there are many courses, but what the metrology that it's sometimes essential to have an hands-on feeling what is going on and all this thing. So that you can learn only in the lab. Another source of knowing what is going on in metrology and what is all about it, there are regular important conferences like the MAGMED. We are and we have seen that so many good lectures are being given by the many experts both from India and from abroad. And they are giving a very good what is the state of the art of today. So, but sometimes it may be difficult for the theaters to assimilate all these things, but for the, uh, even the experienced people, it's a good information for them. So there are, in time and frequency, there are many regular important courses, and in general, CPF is basically in there, EPF is there, and ADMIT is there, which is a very important course. But attending conference is a big issue, which is happening in the far away countries, because you do not have fun, you cannot always attend. It's very useful. So, but the one thing is that, that we may get support from the parent organization to attend those conferences. We may get support from the other government organization or sometimes the organizer sometimes support. But there is a practice, this is the Young Scientist Award. Young Scientist Award is for the development that this has been introduced almost in all field of conferences and uh, workshops. But that is limited. So, very large number of people cannot avoid that. But at least there is something. That is a one good point. And there are few specific international and national practices. So what is the Indian effort? Indian effort, NPL has taken a lead for the last two, three decades. I'm seeing it that NPL produces a regular calendar of training, training age schedules and all the things. Even I've seen one <laughs> reflect what is the program of NPL in uh, 2020 and 23. I've seen and it covered most of the parameters. Now, another thing I think that is, I should be confirmed that I have seen in the net that the certification course in precision metrology and quality launched by NPL uh, in 2018. And this course covers, I have seen most of the subjects. And it also proposes a PG diploma course one year by SCCSR. I do not know about this, what is the status? Director is sitting here of NPL. He may a little bit throw some light of the, uh, my presentation over. So we learn important. And there are, and time and frequency training on demand that I have seen, though it is in the calendar, it doesn't happen every year, I have seen, because we contacted when there is a demand. So, similar to National Physical Office, there are many others, organizations like NBL, QCI, and also Legal Metrology and the BS, BSI, so BIS. So, they also conduct some sort of trading courses <laughs> in different parameters. It's subjects of interest, for example, NABL, NABL uh, conduct a course for the assessors. So generally the assessors for the accreditation of different laboratories. So um, uh, legal metrology, that metrology society that is for the admin is a uh, uh, product of metrology society of India. They organize every year, which was detailed by uh, Dr. Sanjay Yadav, that how it is organized at present. Uh, previously, it was every three years. Now it is every year, once in NPL as an international conference, and then there's a national conference in different other laboratories. So BIS, as I have told, that BI also organized few courses and uh, metrology, yeah, legal metrology department, it was also the BIS 
Dixit was there. Uh, they also organized few courses, but their courses mainly for uh, legal persons. So another important thing is that what I failed when NPL was supposed to produce CMC, I failed hardly anybody knows how to produce CMC. So there was a lack of understanding and all this thing because it is not the some sort of certificate that how a particular instrument is behaving. It is a what is the capability of a particular lab in different parameters. So that needs a proper training that how it should be generated. So in view of this, I have recently seen a survey by USA in recent times that what happens? What how the people learn metrology? So their first point is that specific metrology course in the university and colleges. And approximately it was counted that roughly six metrology institutes in and around the USA and Canada. And out of that Butler County Community College and Community College of Aurora and VA in Colorado, they conduct this course. The basic important thing is that they had a tie up with some industry. That is how the course is being sustained. In India, there is no such course. Even MSI, I think some of you may recall that MSI has really debated on that whether MSI will start some course on MSI, yeah, on metrology. And it was strongly debated. Ultimately, boiled down that who will be taken on the course if I if we try to conduct. So that was a big bottleneck. That question was not properly answered by anybody that how it can make it popular to sustain it unless you tie up with some industry or some uh, organization who will be taking some of the students or generate some uh, counseling that there you can be placed. It cannot be sustained. So military education is in operation for a long time because, but it is only for the defense personnel. Mm -hmm. It is not available for the general public. The quality of whether it told in India, NABL and BIS uh, generate quality program, but that is time to time as and when it is required. This main thing, what we learned is that hands-on problem on the job, hands-on experience. So that is most of the uh, metrologists sitting here, they have learned after joining NPL and got training uh, internally and reading some books. So this is all safe talk. Now, in the entrance, as I told, I think this is the experience of most of us that when we entered NPL in any metrology sections, we didn't know. What is metrology? But as because of our background in different fields, so we have go to the different sections and started learning and just here. So my question is that it is by the sheer enthusiasm, greed, and the hard work that is how NPL is sustaining the metrology groups because there is no formal training with none of them or sometimes they have a scattered knowledge. So my concluding remarks is that most of the courses, online courses are related to physical mechanical standards. That also I have noted. That is not on all parameters. Metrology concepts is a specialized field. And these concepts require many fields. So need start with suitable knowledge. So anybody cannot, any university teacher if you call, they cannot teach you metrology, even if you take experts from NPL. So they cannot run a course in different colleges. Knowledge and skill and ability. But my understanding is really confusing in the sense that over the years, even when we started master degree, it was physics, chemistry, mathematics, which got the main subjects. And if you go to the engineering, you will have electrical, mechanical, and civil. Those are the main three subjects. But in course of time, all these subjects has got a lot of diversification. 
what is the electrical there are electrical there are electronics communication engineering in mechanical you have the automatic and yeah. yeah. all there is a lot of progression in then computer science state computer science not only computer science you have information technology that many type of it but there is not a single course that is specialized course on any topics if part is used dedicated to the metal still not existing i i learned physics with a specialization in electronics someone has learned physics with a specialization in condensation so that sort of small module may be introduced in the metrology so at least people will be more comfortable so and another thing is that replenishment of stock should be balanced with the retirement and retaining issues so when a experienced person is leaving so his knowledge should be shared to the existing students existing uh, scientists to the greatest level possible and he may be don't retain for few months on all this thing just to train them regular training of the current staff should be continuous because standard changes because in 1990 year 2019 we have changed the definition of uh, sims the change of the uh, definition of the second is in the offing so we we'll have to cope with those situations now the points to be considered this is what i would like to say in the final conclusion is that i suggest there should be a formation of consortia institutes comprised of educational institutes relevant laboratories industry and practitioners and regulators they should formulate some course for courses to be included in the academic uh, in the edc courses to during their either master degree or engineering courses now this requires while you are taking some tie up with some companies and here is involved now curriculum of engineering to school and technical university other training is to should contain at least some basic courses on it metrology education should be designed for customers there are many takers customers for managers who are responsible for the decision making in financing measurement and equipment for educating metrologists experts and for the trainers and tracers so the metrology testing calibration has a different level of accuracy and requirement so a particular course can be cannot cover both the things all the level of accuracy so it should be designed again for high precision only for the apex level trees and the medium and low frequency and maybe for the uh, secondary level trees so that sort of things we have to work out now with this thing another thing i would like to uh, talk about this is why my question is that that there is a lot of work uh, talk going on digital transformations and we should use this concept into the courses whether apart from using the digital transformation how it is going on we should use the present day digital techniques to tweak few modules on different topics and that should be catered to the tracers for their learning so with this i thank you for your uh, attention and i'll be happy if there is some discussion because there are very senior person sitting here um, thank you now you are in inner city so i think uh, you can introduce uh, some courses in inner city yourself in the inner city with a small group then that will be pro propagate to different groups in the different departments of the inner city so that will be good uh, can do that so thank you very much uh, once again for the excellent talk is any question or something because we are already running from short time maybe we will stop okay And the only thing is that my personal report doesn't do anything because that should be from the. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, next talk from Mr. Uh, C. B.
It doesn't just say you have to pin this thing. Black case here. Okay. Is it close to that? Hard on Sound, 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 sound. Maybe Mike Salu, Mike Salu, Salu. Today I will introduce you a very unique system in India. That is a primary standard diagnostic system for here. I think all of you might uh, would be very familiar with the uh, uh, calibration, especially fluid flow because Enfield is also having a fluid flow. And uh, liquid calibration or gas calibration with the secondary reference standard and liquid calibration both with the reference standards and gravimetric system. We are familiar, but uh, it is slightly uh, different when we go for uh, the biometric system for a year, and in my uh, lecture, this lecture, I'll introduce you how we developed a biometric system in India. I am presently heading the airflow calibration facilities of FCRI. Actually, initially, uh, FCRI uh, expertization was given by UNDP, so many foreign laboratories experts came and they established this facility and initially few of us went to different laboratories across the world and got trained so we have started at that time an airflow calibration facility at the atmospheric pressure so it is it is in a suction mode that's air inside a room condi conditioned air is sucking through the uh, test meter and then parallelly we have uh, seriously we have reference meter and then finally, it is decided to outside it. So it is a comparison method with the critical flow venture in also. Later on, we have extended the from atmospheric pressure to 20 bar. So in 20 bar, we have multiple facilities. One is a CLRT of closed loop air test facility and wind tunnel facility, basically used for calibration of velocity sensors. PSGS, primary standard diametric system, and then blow down and open loop. So we are we are using many different kinds of flow meter for different applications which require a regular calibration. So basically the CLAT of closed loop pad test facility, we use turbine meters as a reference meter, which was initially calibrated at Pixar facilities in Germany and NMI facilities in Netherlands. So after establishing this facility, it is very difficult to send back those meters back to the uh, those uh, calibration facilities because either uh, we don't have any uh, reference standard for half a year or we should have a parallel set of meters so if one set is gone to calibration we use the other set and uh, routinely we have to send it it is very costly and time consuming so we thought of uh, making a primary system biometric system for a year and i will detail you the the particular facility. So as you know, we our labs are accredited by NABA and two facilities that is closed loop air test facility and the primary standard biometric facility both are certified by NMI. So we invited their experts and they certified that we are at par with the, uh, their laboratory and we follow 17,025. <coughs> 
this is specification of the particular lab capacity 15 <laughs> cube per hour. Pressure 2 to 20 bar, any pressure. Line size 50 mm, 2 inch, and uncertainty is 0.1 percentage. Basically, it is working an open loop mode. That is, we take air, compressed air from a reservoir, process it, and then finally discharge it. So, it is in, uh, in an open loop mode, and basically, we use uh, compressed air with a pressure up to 20 bar. So, major components of uh, gravimetric system we have a 1500 liter uh, spherical vessel in which we collect the air and basically we measure the air collected in the spherical vessel. Why we have selected the spherical shape is to reduce the uh, quantity of metal because that is giving the maximum volume. So we, we want to reduce the overall weight of the container. So we have made it in a spherical uh, shape. It is placed on a 1200 kg electronic comparator. So directly, what is the damped area? We get the mass. And we use critical flow injury nozzles, otherwise called the sonic nozzles. Don't type pressure regulator to regulate the pressure or adjust the pressure at the test section. A diverter mechanism and pipes and other components. The principle of operation is weighing of air in a spherical vessel. So, for liquid application, it is very easy to weigh the liquid because any container you take it, either tear the initial mass or note down the initial mass, collect some of the liquid, take the final mass and time either a stopwatch or a counter, whatever it is. You easily get and you can compare with the mass to mass or flow rate to flow rate, whatever it is. It is quite easy, but it is somewhat complex for uh, gas because of the compressibility of nature. And measurement of time. Variation of ambient air density is negligible for two times of mass measurement. So, particularly, buoyancy compensation, we are not uh, considered while the making the measurement, mass measurement. Pressure regulator maintains a constant pressure. Uh, it can uh, maintain the downstream pressure with a better than one percentage of such pressure. Critical flow engine nozzles we maintain uh, what is the flow rate, required flow rate, and real time pressure, temperature, and time are collected through that diffusion system. So, if you these are all the uh, available information of uh, the gravimetric system across the world, but I, I, I do not have any uh, direct comparison with the FCRI facility with the other such facilities because details are not published or not much available. Each system may be from each country may be different, uh, different from each other. So of course, the JSTOR sir would have seen from NAST gravimetric system and he has seen SCRI facility also may be possible to put some light on that one. I will come to the system treatment and storage. So we have uh, for reciprocating, simple reciprocating compressors. Two at a time we generally use and two will be standby. And then we have uh, filters, uh, five micron filter, oil filter, and uh, other filters, and the dehumidifier. So we generate a dryness of minus 40 degree dew point or better. That is with the use of uh, two uh, heatless dryers, basically dryers. Then this uh, conditioned uh, air is stored in four vessels. Each vessel is having a uh, capacity of 11 meter cube. So all the four vessels are interconnected through a 12 inch manifold with individual isolation valves. So we can take any combination depend upon the requirement. And this uh, setup we use for testing purpose also, testing of safety valves, basically discharge capacity. Earlier it was Capacity determination was not done, uh, but nowadays, other than the set pressure certification, capacity certification at the design stage is also mandatory. So, to some extent, we use this facility for testing of safety relief valves. 
and this area stored in these vessels are being taken to the gravimetric system. So this is the photograph of that gravimetric system. So this is the spherical vessel you can see, and that is placed on a camberator. So this is the camberator, 1200 kg camberator, and we have five pins, and this is the dome rotor regulator. So we can set the the desired pressure at the downstream, and we measure the dew point temperature also using the pesto instrument and the diverter system. So, initially, we diverted to nosing pressure. So, this is the photograph of that system. And since the balance is very sensitive, we put a perspex enclosure so that the local air movement is not affecting the mass measurement. And generally, Initially, we were using for a calibration of uh, prolonged stack for mass meters, and now we are restricted to use the system with the calibration of our reference system only. So, this is the schematic. Actually, we have a compressor and a pre filter and after filter, so that is uh, removing the oil traces because of reciprocation. Uh, compressor, there will be uh, oil traces that will be. Removing the pre filter and after filter. Then an intercooler to reduce the temperature. And after that, it is connected in a one meter cube vessel. From there, it is passing through two drivers which are connected parallelly. So that maintains the dew point temperature. And from there, it uh, stores the air in these four vessels. All the vessels are connected to the manifold with the valves. And this air we are taking to the ground system. And we can take this air to the closed loop system. And here we have a small two meter cube uh, vessel, a plate bar, which is used for actuation purpose for instrument air. Uh, you know, using this. Okay, so these are air storage vessels and compressor systems. So this is the gravimetric system I can explain. So air from the uh, four cylinders it is coming through a 150 mm. Stainless steel tube, and here we have the regulator. So we adjust the pressure in the regulator that is manually. So whatever is the required uh, pressure for calibration, we adjust it manually. And this is the test section where we mount the test meter, and then it goes to the vessel. It is connected to the vessel. So simple mechanism and like a liquid flow uh, gravimetric system, we can say that we admit the air, collect the air in the container, either note, the, note down the initial mass or tear the initial mass, note down the final mass. So you know the mass time you can uh, note with uh, a stopwatch or other digital uh, counters. So that is a simple uh, mechanism. But as such, this is not uh, this will not work in a calibration method because it is a closed container. So when we put air into the container, that generates a back pressure. So when the back pressure arises, the flow rate gradually decreases. So we will not get a steady flow rate at the test section. So in that case, we will not be able to calibrate the meter because the flow will be unsteady and the flow will get seized when the inlet pressure and the tank pressure reaches the same. <clears throat> so to overcome this issue, we need a steady flow rate. We introduce a critical flow injury nozzle in between. So nozzles, as uh, uh, some of you might be knowing that, as long as it is in critical condition or in choked condition, the downstream pressure rates will not pass to the upstream side. So the critical ratio be somewhere around a point 0.8. That is the pressure ratio of downstream to upstream is about 0.8 or less. We can say that that is in a critical condition. And in that case, this pressure rise will not pass to the upstream side. So when we keep a nozzle inside it and then allow the flow to into the chamber, the pressure rise will not pass to the other side. But we have to see that when it crosses the critical condition, the flow rate reduces. So the overall testing is restricted till this pressure, downstream pressure, reaches about 80 percentage of the inlet pressure. So before that, we have to stop the flow. So that is the duration of one particular flow rate. 
and nozzles are designed for a particular single flow rate. So to get a different flow rate, we have to use different different flow rates or keeping a uh, control valve here, we can regulate the pressure so that mass flow rate will get the changes. So this will keep the flow rate uh, steady. And when we start the flow, it starts from zero and it will take a delta T time to reach up to the steady flow. So when we directly dump the flow into the vessel, the time starts where the flow is not reached to the steady condition. So initially the flow will be bypassed to atmosphere. And when we ensure that the flow becomes steady by making the pressure and condition, it will be diverted to the vessel. So the vessel pump is connected with a timer. So, and then all the parameters are accurate through a computer, that aggression system. So we can preset the critical condition, either point date or the, if we are using a very low flow rate, it takes very long time to fill the cylinder. So we can choose any value less than point date. So once it reaches that point there, two minutes. When it reaches that point there, it will stop. And again, uh, uh, we can take the mass measurement. But basically, mass measurement, if you take uh, uh, into the piping, it will not be corrected because the tension on the piping will be influencing the mass measurement. So to get the correct mass, uh, the entire vessel will be disconnected, should, should be disconnected from the piping. So here we have a few kind of coupling. So at the start of the uh, experiment or uh, run, we disconnect it and tear the balance. And after connecting, we will continue the process. And at the end, again, the entire piping is under pressure. So we cannot detach it. So a small portion of air from this area, we have to discharge and then decouple the Pressure from the other piping and again make the mass measurement. So you have the mass and the, the, valve, the valve is connected with a timer, so you will get the mass or mass flow rate. So if you look at for a 0.3%, 0.5% accuracy, this is well, but we are aiming at a much better power rise. So we have to contribute what is the loss of air which is not, not directly coming into the directly coming into the comparator. So this is to be called as a control volume. So though that volume is also determined by gravimetric system, we fill what, what with the water and from the weight and density, we determine the volume. And from initial pressure and final pressure, initial temperature and final uh, temperature, we know what is the density difference. And from the volume, we can estimate what is the mass of air we have discharged for uh, decoupling. So that mass will be added to the final mass and then we take the total mass. So this is the gravimetric system. So this process is slightly complex. So that is why these systems are very rare. And uh, unlike the gravimetric system, one minute sir, unlike the other liquid gravimetric system, the most difficult part is the container mass, because in liquid, the container mass is very, very less compared to the mass of liquid we are collecting. But that is the reverse. The container mass is very, very higher than the mass of air we are collecting. So in our particular case, the container mass is about, container and attachment mass is about 850 kg, and we collect air of 2 kg to 22 kg. So the balance should be very sensitive. So. This is on 200 capacity, the readability is 1 gram. So specialized balances are being used, and that's why we cannot explore much a higher capacity because availability of balance and the pressure of flow rate required and weight of the container, we have to optimize so that it is within the available specification of the balance, we have to manage with the flow. So that's why we have gone up to 52 inch line and 50 meter cube per hour. This is regarding which include. So this will be uh, calibration chart of the mass comparator. And we use uh, ICA make uh, PPD 200 uh, pressure sensor. So actually it is a three channel 
you can see that uh, 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 red and green it is overlapping because that is inbuilt within the cabinet and uh, the violet color that is the channel third is kept outside so there is a small difference uh, between uh, and the other two sensors and then this uh, we use a uh, black facility a temp pro model uh, temperature sensor the class a pro and these are also some of the results when we do the calibration of critical nozzles. So this uh, this is giving overall. Uh, each nozzle is calibrated in two years interval. So you can see that it is in two years of uh, history of the different nozzles. So overall system accuracy is uh, around one percentage in the biometric system, and uh, calibration is. Uh, Critical nozzle, we land up at around uh, one five percentage. Of course, we do calibration of turbine meters and PD meters, but it is slightly lower. Let's say around even. So briefly, I have explained the gravimetric system. So any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Split. Sorry, I have got on the primary standard gravimetric Very clinic. My doubt is related to your chamber. Why NRGs are non returning goals are not used for in the you know pipeline? Because you said that back pressure you know restrict the inflow. So why NRGs are not used? Fundamentally, why NRGs are discouraging this system? Why they don't use? Yes, uh, dehumidification is very critical in one of your system. So, how frequently you calibrate the dew point? Yeah. And from where? Yeah. 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 No, no, sir. It is, a, it is a humidity parameter. Yes, sir. And you yes. should know that uh, the facility is available in BL. But when you calculate, even 10% of the other things there, final result is 21% of the facility. We measure the moisture rate, which is the moisture rate per year. That influences the moisture rate. How do you calibrate the moisture? Thank you very much. Thank you, audience, for the listeners. now, this is our tea break. Thank you, sir, for the for chairing this session in a smooth manner. Now I request Dr. Nakate to yes. felicitate Dr. P. Banerjee with a token of gratitude. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Dakati to felicitate Mr. C. Suresh from CRA.
now i request dr sanjay yadav to felicitate dr s jaiswal with a token of momentum we now have a tea break we will come back at around 11:45 am आप सेवा कर रहे हैं और इस तरह से